major abdominal surgery. Just on Friday, Her Royal Highness Catherine Middleton said that she had cancer. How did this happen? How can it be missed? How can you prevent it? I'm Dr. Hassan. I'm a board certified anesthesiologist. I treat a lot of patients all the time. Let's get into it. Here's the video that the princess in Buckingham Palace posted on Friday where she talked about her diagnosis. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London. And at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This, of course, came as a huge shock, and William and I have been doing everything we can now, as hard as that is to watch, you can tell that she's very stressed out there. You can also tell that she's very tired. She's probably been through a lot, especially the nonstop media scrutiny. A lot of people saying a lot of random things, including she'd been abducted, something terrible had happened, Princess Diana, a lot of rumors. I'm sure, it weighed on her mental health and now having to deal with such a huge diagnosis, especially having young children and being in the public eye. How can we prevent this? How did this happen? How could the princess have gone in for a routine surgery, ended up coming out with a cancer diagnosis? When you go into surgery, it's kind of like going into a black box. You never know what you're going to see inside, even with the most detailed tests. That's why sometimes during surgery, when you're slotted for a time frame of only a few hours, it takes a lot longer because once you get into the abdomen or you get into the different parts of your body, you have to adjust the plan of action while it's happening. More than likely, what probably happened was the princess went in for surgery, they took out specimens, they thought they got everything, they sent it to the pathology lab a few days later, or maybe within 24 hours because she is the princess. They looked under the microscope, they found that there was cancerous cells present. It sounds like there was only a little bit of cancerous cells present, it wasn't full-blown cancer, and the adjuvant chemotherapy was given as a preventative measure to make sure that any of the cancer cells that could be potentially floating around in the body are eliminated and taken care of. What does this mean for the princess? Well, it means one, that during chemotherapy, which is usually delayed four to six weeks after surgery because of the healing process that she probably won't make any sort of public appearances because it could be a risk to her life. When you start chemotherapy, like I talked about before, it causes a lot of changes in your body, but more importantly, it causes you to be immunocompromised. When you're immunocompromised, you do not want to be around a lot of people because people carry pathogens. For her sake and for the sake of her family, she'll probably take time to spend with them and be alone in a more safe environment. That's for the better. She has to be able to explain it to her kids and she has to be with her family, her loved ones, her support system. That's why she probably won't be in the public eye. More than likely, everybody in the media who was doubting what was going on in the past needs to relax. When the princess talked about adjuvant chemotherapy, what did she mean? Words actually matter in this instance. Let's talk about it. Adjuvant chemotherapy is typically given in conjunction with surgery to get rid of all the extra cells that might be floating around. When you go in for surgery and you have some tumor removed, the majority of the tumor is removed surgically. However, it's impossible because we don't have microscopes in the operating room to see little cells to remove all the tumor cells. Now, what do oncologists typically do in order to get rid of the majority, if not all the cells and try to cure the problem? They give you chemotherapy. There's two forms of chemotherapy, either it's through an IV or through a pill form. The pill form is more for long-term maintenance while the IV form is for acute treatment. Now, if you didn't know, chemotherapy is basically targeting the fastest reproducing cells in your body. That includes your hair, your skin and your nails. That's why when you see somebody who's going through chemo, they end up losing their hair, their nails, and they have very tight skin because your body isn't able to reproduce those organs. There are five major organs inside your abdomen that could potentially become cancerous. Let's dive in. Starting with number one, the biggest organ in your body, your liver. What's the role of the liver in the body? Basically, it detoxes your blood. All the blood from your GI tract and out, all through your body comes through your liver, it detoxes it, and pushes it back out. How is liver cancer detected? Liver cancer is typically detected by accident, not by intention. What does this mean? It means that usually either your blood tests come up abnormally high or during a routine scan, they find some sort of mass and or a cyst and they wanna go in and take it out. Usually the workup process includes biopsies and the treatment is multifactorial. You could have the liver removed, which is a major, major surgery. You can also have part of the liver removed, which is also major, but not super major. And nowadays you can have what they call ablation, where an interventional radiologist goes in with a giant needle, either through your blood vessels or from the outside, goes and actually burns the tumors inside your liver. It's actually remarkable, it's very pain-free, and it's a lot less risk than open surgery. However, which one's better is still up in the air. Fortunately enough, liver cancer is on the downtrend, especially because of new medications that have come out in the past three to five years, including Harvoni, which is a hep C treatment. And hep C was the biggest risk factor for liver cancer in the past because of the rapid turnover of the virus inside the liver. It's actually quite remarkable that liver cancer is on the downtrend, and now most of the cancers that are associated with liver have to do with self-injury including drinking too much alcohol. So that's actually a positive trend, but what kind of symptoms would you have if you had liver cancer? Well, number one, you'd have bloating, you'd have nausea, you'd have diarrhea, and you'd have probably have some sort of pain, but not too much because your liver can actually function effectively even if 
70% of it is not working. Does that make any sense? So even if 70% of your liver is in failure, 80% of your liver is in failure, that last 10, 20% can actually hold on for a very long time. So unfortunately, what that means is that most people do not discover that they have liver cancer until the tail end, unless it's incidentally found. So that's usually a major operation. The next major organ you think about in the abdomen, you have two of them, is your kidneys. Kidney cancer is usually very aggressive, especially renal cell carcinoma. Typically, urologists or general surgeons, if they see a mass in your kidney and if you are at high risk for renal cell carcinoma, they take the whole kidney out. There is also a possibility that you can take half a kidney out or partial nephrectomy. It is a lot more rare. Most of the time, they just take one out and leave you with the other one. It can be curative, but sometimes it requires adjuvant chemotherapy if they think there might be a spread. What are the signs and symptoms of kidney cancer? Typically, it presents with either pain in your back and or you have blood in your urine. You get a urine analysis where they look at your urine and you have high levels of proteins. Then usually you have some sort of scan that tells you if you have any sort of insult or injury to your kidney and then you kind of work up from there. If there is a high suspicion of kidney cancer, if you have a history of diabetes, smoking, family history of kidney cancer, more than likely the urologist and the surgeon will probably just take the kidney out, especially if you have a good functioning other kidney. Now, if you don't have a good functioning other kidney, that's when you go down the road of partial nephrectomies and all those types of things. Bowel cancer, also known as GI cancer, it's your large bowel, your small bowel. There has been an uptick, almost a doubling in bowel cancer in young females and young males under the age of 55, almost doubled in percentage. What are the reasons for an increasing number of bowel cancer, especially in younger individuals? Well, scientists at major medical organizations are linking the increase in bowel cancer, especially in younger males and females, to high processed food diets, smoking, obesity, diabetes, you know, the general metabolic syndromes. Now, the reason why this is alarming is because the main way to prevent GI cancers is by having colonoscopies. And during a colonoscopy, the GI doctor goes into your colon, they find any polyps, they just clip them, and that could potentially save your life. The issue is that until recently, the recommendation was not to get a colonoscopy until the age of 55. It has been dropped to 45, but the majority of patients that I see usually wait until 50 to get their colonoscopies. But this is kind of a wake-up call that if you are scheduled for a colonoscopy or you're getting closer to the age of 45, like I am, get ready to get the colonoscopy. The prep is terrible, the procedure is quick, but it could save your life. That little polyp inside your colon could grow into a colorectal cancer. If they can nip it in the butt, no pun intended in the beginning, it could save your life in the future. What kind of symptoms do you typically have with colon cancer? Well, colon cancer typically presents with nausea, diarrhea, blood in your stool, abdominal cramping, abdominal indigestion. They are kind of vague symptoms, but usually there's also a concurrent weight loss, unintended weight loss, because your bowel is the main mechanism for how you absorb nutrients. So if you have an issue in your bowel, typically you drop weight very fast as a result, not only of the diarrhea, but not being able to absorb the nutrients that you need in order to grow. If you have these symptoms, make sure you talk to your doctor about it as soon as possible. Getting a colonoscopy is pretty low risk as far as anesthetic procedures go, and it can save your life and have a huge impact over the course of your life. Finally, we talk about uterine cancer and ovarian cancer. Uterine cancer and ovarian cancer both have been on the rise, especially in young females. This has been thought to be directly linked to the HPV virus, and now there's a vaccine out there to treat for it. What kind of symptoms do you typically have with uterine cancer or ovarian cancer? The symptoms kind of blend together because it's all in the same kind of region. Usually it presents with heavy menstrual periods, cramping, abdominal pain, unintended weight loss, pain down your legs, and especially pain in your abdomen area. There is a huge differential diagnosis, especially if you present to your doctor saying you have abdominal pain or increased pain with cramping during your periods. Usually the first thought goes to endometriosis, which is an outgrowth of the endometrial lining, which is usually present inside your uterus, but it gets to other parts of your abdomen and then that hurts every time you go through a menstrual cycle. That also leads to increased bleeding because it's not in the right location. So you usually end up being anemic, more tired, and these battery of tests lead the doctor and the team to find out that you have some issue going on in your abdomen. And more than likely, if the thought is that it's endometriosis, endometriosis that usually you don't think it's cancer. Endometriosis is just an outgrowth of the tissue. There are small instances where it can come back as cancerous, or if you go in and you take an ovary out and you send it to the pathology lab, pathologist then reads it and says there are atypical cells present. Now I have to say this is exceedingly rare. Usually whatever the OBs and the GYN doctors see on your scans, those are usually pretty correct. But like with everything in medicine, you always double check and you send those specimens, which are the uterus or the ovaries to the pathologist. The pathologist examine it under a microscope and they come back with the final diagnosis of Few days later. What is the most effective way to prevent uterine cancer and cervical cancer? Well, it's the HPV vaccine has been fantastic in treating, especially individuals that are more promiscuous and more active. It can be a lifeline. It can be a life-saving treatment. You should look into it, talk to your doctor about it because it's a simple shot that could prevent a lifelong illness. Ovarian cancer is not as easily prevented with a shot, but it has a strong linkage to smoking. So if you do smoke, please think about your ovaries.
The most important thing you need to get from this video is not what type of cancer Kate Middleton has, it's that you need to be an advocate for yourself. What do I mean when I say be an advocate and a loud advocate for yourself? If you are experiencing any new symptoms that are different from your usual, like heavier menstrual cramping, more nausea, more diarrhea, something doesn't feel right, you have to be loud and you have to be vocal about it when you see your physician or you see your medical practitioner. Human nature, especially in medicine, is that if you downplay your symptoms, the physician or the treating medical professional is going to downplay the treatment. So if you go in and say, I have a little bit of nausea, they'll give you some Zofran. If you say you have an extreme amount of nausea and it's been impacting my daily life, it's not the same that I've had before, it might preempt the physician or the medical practitioner to order a scan or get some blood tests. Doctors are humans too. They usually want to treat whatever symptoms you come in with. So if you come in saying that I have a little bit of this and a little bit of that, you'll get a little bit of this treatment, a little bit of that treatment. If you come in strong and saying I have increased menstrual periods, I have increased diarrhea, I have increased nausea, then more than likely you'll get lab tests, you'll get scans done, and you'll find out if it is a real problem or if it's not a real problem. Now, every scan and test comes with its own risk that you got to remember, but if you feel like something is drastically off from your normal, you have to be a loud advocate because nobody else is going to advocate for you. You are your best advocate. Give her some time, give her the space. Cancer is a serious diagnosis. It takes a long time to get through and it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're black or white. It doesn't matter if you're on this side of the country or that side of the country. So here's the hoping that the princess gets better, gets her chemotherapy, gets rid of all the cancer cells, is with her loved ones and heals properly and then comes back you know, into the public limelight. I hope this video helps to clear up the situation for Her Royal Highness the Princess, the Royal Family, Buckingham Palace, Anybody else watching this video, please, the key takeaway is not what kind of cancer the princess has, it's how can you prevent it, what signs and symptoms you should look out for as a patient, as yourself. Praying that she does better. We'll see you guys on the next one.